Well, it's Wake Up With KC, and today I want to talk about reinventing yourself. And during the COVID and all the chaos and everything, and everything being shut down, you know, I felt like that was a time to look back, evaluate, reevaluate, and look at ways to reinvent what it is that you truly desire to do. And I have met an amazing and wonderful person who continuously does that. And she joins us today. Please welcome Susan Lanier. Susan, hey. welcome. <laughs> I love the shades. Hmm? I love those shades. Thank you. I do too. Uh, they they block the glare from the computer. So, and, you know, it's, it's, it's nice. Enough, but I know that the lights reflect. So I have to take them off. But anyway. <laughs> Yeah, they, so, they really are help with the computer lights and stuff. You've it's, had many credits from your acting, music, uh, you're a coach. I mean, there's like so many things that you have done. And can you share like how this all began for you? Like when did you discover like this, you know, you wanted to be in acting, you wanted to do music, you wanted to do photography. Like how did you discover that and wanted to continue doing that? You know, my, my passions for all of those things that you just mentioned started when I was very young. Um, I, it's, I, there's not a time in my life that I don't remember um, um, that I wasn't performing in some way. I think my grandmother might have planted the seed um, for me to be a performer in some way. I was, she put me in dance class early at three and uh, she would make me walk around the house with a book on my head. So I would have straight posture and she would talk about pronouncing my words correctly and things like that. And and someday you might wanna be an actress. And, and I think that seed was planted around the age of three or four or five, I, you know, that, that things the the seeds were being planted for what might be in the future um also um i was always passionate about photography so as a child i would run around the yard with a camera all the time a brownie camera my dad had bought me and then he i shot so much film that he actually learned how to develop it and so that was something that kind of brought us together and that's always been a passion. So it's the the music was always something. My granddaddy was a, a blues player, and he had a piano on the on his front porch. And um, so when we would go visit him in East Texas, all the musicians around would come and they would play. And my mom was a great singer, and she would sing harmonies and alto parts. And I would just watch in awe and go, "Oh my God." I, these are all artists. So I was surrounded at an early age with the door beginning to open into the arts as where I would go. Wow. And then you, you played in some movies. Yeah. Between TV movies and whatnot, especially in the seventies, you know, what 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 was some of the because it wasn't all bed of roses trying to pursue an acting career. So what kind of advice between what you've learned in, in you know back in those days and then what's going on now, what can you tell a young, you know, person that really wants to be into acting? What kind of wisdom would you share with them? Well, I any of the art forms, but particularly acting, but all of them um, require large amounts of time of work. So if you think, I, 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 if people watch TV or they watch movies and they go, oh God, that looks like so much fun. That would be great. And um, it's so e it looks so easy. It makes, it's our job to make it look easy but it's not easy. It's hard, hard work. It requires 
work. It requires talent to some degree. Uh, the main thing, it, re it requires some luck, being in the right place at the right time, knowing the right people. Uh, but more than anything, it requires drive and ambition. And a lot, I know so many actors who are so talented, but they won't go get their headshots done and they won't put themselves up on the sites so that they can be, they won't do the business part of show business. Show business is a business. It's not just the fun or give me a job. So um, that has not changed from the 70s to now. It's just, I think now there are easier venues uh, and platforms to get exposure, which we did not have available in the 70s. But there were so many great agents and people that I was lucky to work with that pushed the career for me. But it doesn't mean I didn't have to do a whole lot of work. Yeah, and it's not the work you put into it and the drive and the ambition that you have. Yes. And with that, it's wow, you just like blew my mind on that one. <laughs> and then you you met your husband, Delaney. Yeah. In nineteen. And when you met him, how did you meet him? Well, um, he, I had starred in the Hills of Eyes and he had gone to see the Hills of Eyes at a drive-in with his then girlfriend. And um, the next night after he saw it, he was playing at um, the, was it the Troubadour? He says it was the Troubadour. I think it was the Star, Star, Starwood, but anyway, uh, one of the big Hollywood clubs. And um, his trumpet player, named Daryl Leonard, uh, was in the band. And Daryl was married to my girlfriend, Lindy. And she said, let's go hear Delaney Bramlett. And I said, no, I've got to learn some lines. And she said, come on, let's go hear him. And, and we'll just stay for one set. So we drove to Hollywood and uh, she had to go near the stage to say, Daryl, we're here. And Delaney saw me and he took off his guitar and he came down off the stage and he said, I saw you in this movie last night. And he said, give me your phone number. I'm going to marry you. And I went, I have a boyfriend. And he said, I don't care. And uh, so <laughs> I gave him my number and I gave him my number and uh, the rest was history. We fell in love in 1977 and only because he had seen me in the Hills of Eyes. Wow. That's called persistence right there. Like he just sees you next day, sees you and like sees you on a movie, then sees you in person. Like I'm going to marry you. <laughs> and you're just, I don't know if it was you freak out. <laughs> I don't know if it was a premonition and it was kind of a joke, you know, uh, but it came true. I'm sure he was joking with me and I found that kind of sexy and he was very sexy and so talented. And so, you know, uh, I fell immediately in love and we were pretty inseparable for many years. And then, you know, we had a couple of dips in our relationship and breaks, breakups. And then, you know, we would go, always go back, always end up back together. Wow. And then did that help you with your, your with your music writing as well? Did that like spark even a more fire? Yeah. I, mean, I had written little stupid little songs from when I was, eight years old you know i mean i was always into doing musicals and in new york audition for hair and uh, some musicals in new york when i was a young actress there way before i met delaney and uh, got cast in hair i didn't get to do um uh the show because of personal reasons but um i was in rehearsal for hair and um so i had been exposed to a lot of rock music and had had the hair experience, but I had never taken songwriting seriously, nor had I had the desire to be a songwriter, really. I was much more into performance. So when I met him and he was writing every single day of his life until the last day of his life, when he couldn't write anymore, um, I was, you know, you, you can't go to college and learn the kind of things he could do. So there's no teacher. I mean, to just be around him 
he was so gifted and, and a genius that it just sort of by osmosis. And there'd be times where I'd go, how about this line? And he'd go, yeah, that sounds pretty good. And he'd write that down and, and it would stay. And then I thought, well, I got a line in his song, you know? And, <laughs> um, and, then, and then we began to write songs together. He, would take, he began to take me more seriously. And so we wrote a number of songs together and, and he was just one of the greatest songwriters. So, yeah. And that's how that happened. And had, I, it's like who you know, lucky to, you know, it's who you know too. And I was lucky that he had seen the Hills of Ice and we met, we fell in love. And now, now I'm in a world of mus the best musicians in the world. He produced Eric Clapton and Ike Turner and Joe Cocker. And I mean, you name them. And everybody was in his band, Jimi Hendrix, the Almond Brothers, you know. Wow. Eric, so... But now looking, because uh, I know we talked earlier, and you mentioned Cabaret. Well, couldn't that experience of you learning to write music and everything lead you to the Cabaret of what you're doing now in this project? Yeah, I mean, I after, um, even on, Delaney and I had a, a, a breakup in the mid-80s sometime, and uh, we continued to do music together, however, we were always connected. And um, so uh, I put a band together for myself with his help um, and had my own band playing the Palomino and around LA and a club here called the Rose Tattoo. And I started this one woman sort of show that was strictly music, not a lot of talking. And then after he passed away, right before he passed away, uh, I'd been invited to do um, a show at one of the venues in Los Angeles. And he said, I think you should do that. It'll get your mind off of things if I don't make it. And so three months after he passed, I, I had his band pretty much uh, together with um, his wonderful musicians. I was so blessed about that. Uh, Chad Watson, David Morgan, Hank Barrio, uh, Lynn Finale, I mean, just wonderful musicians. And um, uh, did a show here, sold it out, and started my cabaret show. It's called Swamp Cabaret, Swamp Cabaret, because it's blues and swamp and comedy and all kinds of stuff. And then I, I segue the songs, all of which I've written pretty much uh, into the show. So yeah, I'm, I'm writing music almost every day if I have nothing else to do. Wow, that is a major accomplishment. I'm so excited for you. Thank and you. this has been on like one of your bucket lists to do, hasn't it? Well, um, I uh, had mentioned earlier with you that um, it was just a month ago, a few weeks ago that I said to my friend Stanley, I said, you know, I would um, love to, on my bucket list, I'd love to bring my show to New York. And, and so... I, he said, well, I know this guy who in, in the village, down in the village where I used to live, um, who is really good at putting shows together and you might want to work with him. And I picked up the phone and called him and we had our first session yesterday and it was fabulous. And, um, and, um, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, he, I'm, I'm pretty much open booked now in New York for the fall to do the show. And so it's going to be a lot of work between now and then to get, get back in shape, but I'll be working with this guy uh, in New York, Carl Danielson, who's a wonderful vocal coach and director. Wow. That's so, you're amazing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, you know, going through all your experiences and you did say that you had like so many amazing experiences meeting so many people that you just couldn't pick one. Uh, no, I can't. I was telling you that um, um, I was at a party last night and I was talking to uh, Jennifer Edwards, Blake Edwards' daughter, Julie Andrews' daughter. And, um, and we were talking about maybe doing a little show of some sort together. And we were both agreeing that we wanted to do comedy. And, and I said, well, you know, I used to do stand up on a show called Tony Orlando and Dawn and the Rainbow Hour. And her husband came up and and he said, well, I'm going to look that up on 
YouTube and I said, I know that the footage does not exist. It's an antique. They said, everything's on YouTube. And I went, you're not going to find it. And he typed it in and uh, Tony Orlando and Dawn and the Rainbow Hour and it popped up and there was my face with footage with Freddie Prinze, Alice Cooper and myself doing a sketch. And it kind of like blew me away because I'd never seen it. I didn't know who even released that kind of footage or where they would get it since I'd never even seen it myself. And so it was wild. I bet it was. And it's yeah. a, it is pretty amazing how they're taking because <clears throat> they're like taped on these reels. So they had to transfer all that to digital and then they get the clips and put them up now on, man, that's a long job to do. <laughs> I don't know where, I don't know where people find all this stuff. Honestly, it's amazing. So it's amazing. And it's just like, you know, being in, in films and even on TV, there's, there's a lot of hard work. Like when you're watching the show, you think, you're getting the masterpiece or the movie, the masterpiece, but you don't know what was going behind the scenes to prep, to show you the visual or that masterpiece. Right. I mean, I, when one is just watching television, including myself, and you look at the scenes and you think, oh, that that's fun. Um, that looks easy. That looks glamorous. Um, it's, it, 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 it it's not easy. It's really hard work to be an actor. Acting, I, I, it, it requires a lot of energy, a lot of focus, talent, being in the right place at the right time, meeting the right people. So many ingredients go into whether or not it works for you, where you can make a living at it, and um, uh, uh, much less become a celebrity, I guess you'd call it, or a well-established actor. And girls have, still females have a little harder time at, at maintaining uh, the level. I had a few wonderful years of wonderful work and a body of work and credits. And then things slowed down and I had to, like we were talking about um, at the top of the show, reinventing myself. So when things slowed down and I needed to make money, uh, more money, I became a photographer and I got the opportunity to shoot models in Paris, London, New York, album covers in Nashville, uh, lots and lots of headshots here in LA and, and Dallas. And um, so I got to travel and, you know, and work when I wanted. And I established myself as a, a respected photographer not the greatest. I wasn't, you know, um, Avedon, but you know, or Annie Leibovitz, <laughs> but I, I, did, I did very well with it. And I shot, I got to shoot Willie Nelson and, and Robert Duvall and, um, uh, Mark Cuban and just all kinds of different people over the years. Wow. So, yeah, it, it is a lot of hard work, but it's also consistency and being persistent, self-discipline, and just keep going no matter what, not giving up. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, I, absolutely. You know, um, I mean, if I don't have something to learn or to work on, then I will find my 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 own personality. Maybe this is a character flaw. Maybe it's what has saved me. Um, I have to... Uh, restart and and figure something else to work on you know it's a i love to continue to learn things during covid um i had a lot of alone time and um you know groceries were being delivered i might i might say hello to my neighbor but you know it was like hi um you know and we were i i wanted i'd always wanted to be able to speak french and so I downloaded the Duolingo app and um, spent time, downtime, you know, learning French. And it was, I still am learning, you know, I'm at an, an intermediate, intermediate level now. So it's like, I don't know. I love to learn things all the time. Me too. Speak something in French. 
Oh, <rire> je m'appelle Susan. <rire> Ouh! J'ai par... parlé pour français. Oui. <rire> bon. Ah, super. Yeah. Super. <laughs> I had to take that in college and I didn't like it so much. Oh, I think it's fun. It, you know, it's it's kind of like a board game, really. I mean, Duolingo makes it so much fun. I know this sounds like an ad for Duolingo, but it, it's... But you had that in college then because it was like you had to go to the lab, sit there and listen to a tape. It did not make it fun. No. It is so well, much fun to learn on it. So I, I, I like the Spanish part. I, I had that doing it's the one with the owl, right? Yeah. Okay, I got the Spanish version. So because of my grandchildren, they're they're like six and five and they speak Spanish and English, but my youngest granddaughter, she like speaks Spanglish. It's like Spanish and English together, and I never understand what she's saying practically. <laughs> but they're they're a charm. Uh so that's great. And you have the cabaret, you have um, a couple of other things that you keep doing. Well, keep I'm, I'm um, the, the cabaret show I'm putting back together, but I also um, am auditioning a good bit. Um, I tested yesterday for a comedy in New York and I have an audition when we hang up. Uh, I mean, when we stop the interview and um, so, you know, it's a constant process of uh, waiting for that next acting job. I have a film coming out uh, called Inverted, which is kind of a horror independent movie. Um, also a comedy uh, that I'm involved with um, called Stripped um, with uh, Casper Van Diem and Brooke Lewis uh, Bellis. Um, and uh, that was created by Mark Klebanoff. And we did that pilot right before COVID. And um, if that should sell, then, you know, that would be fun. I, I just won an acting award for best ensemble group for a project uh, that was created by Brooke Lewis Bellis um, called Red Rooms. And so we've been winning some awards um, with the festivals. So that's been cool. So, you know, it's wow. just waiting for the next gig. I just booked a show in Savannah. So I'll be going to Savannah, Georgia at the end of July. It'll be hot, but I love Savannah. So that'll be nice. I love the fact that you just do comedy, you do music, your photography. You, It seems like it's all parallel to all the aspects about who you are and it's yeah. you, you're more authentic you're more you well i am multifaceted that's for sure in terms of um maybe it's even add you know maybe there's a little bit of add in there because um i do often change the channel of where i want to put my focus but only when the channel starts getting boring, you know, <laughs> the gets boring, and I'll switch the, switch the channel. And I think that's kind of how I've always lived my life. You know, it's like, okay, this is, um, it's getting boring. It's boring. I think I'm going to do something else. And, 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 you know, I think what drove me was the passion for what it was that I was doing. Never the fame, never the money, um, uh, that, some of that came and there were times where I was much more well known than say now or whatever, um, where it was, you know, I'd get stopped in the grocery store and stuff like that. That doesn't happen. And I don't look like that young ingenue anymore, mm -hmm. but you know, um, you know, I looked at Freddie Prince on that clip that I saw on YouTube and, and he looked like such a baby and and he was so talented and i'm and i and i think what would he have become what would he be playing now would he still be you know um working all the time and 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 is you know you and so i'm lucky to still be here you know there are a lot of people that aren't um so as long as i'm here 
I don't have the energy in the brain to do things. I have to keep being me, you know? So I mean, that's the best part is just being your authentic self and doing what you love to do. And when you have that and you love yourself for that, it's just those opportunities come to you. It's like a magnet. Well, I hope so I, you know, I don't anticipate them. They usually come by surprise and, um, and then I just say yes or no to the opportunities, but we do, we are responsible partly for creating the opportunities. That's for sure. You know, Absolutely. making sure the people that uh, are producing, directing, or involved with that part know you're alive. You know, that I think that's one of the beautiful things about doing the podcasts is that um, people, you know, no, I'm still here. I was on IMDb once and it said, uh, rest in peace, Susan Lanier. And I, and I thought, what the, you know, it was like, are you kidding me? You, I'm very much alive. I wrote IMDb, please take that off. You know, I'm still here. And, um, and, and, uh, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's all kind of weird. Life is weird. It, well, yeah, and it's interesting, and it's an adventure, and it's a journey to just live. Yeah. And you've yeah. lived a, a an amazing life and wonderful experiences, and I'm just happy to have met you finally. Thank you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice I'd love to come and see your comedy clubs. I didn't really know that you were like really into comedy that like besides welcome back Carter you know that was like something comical back in those days but then I really didn't I saw the the, the horror movie then there was um some things with your music but I didn't really see you know your comedy stuff and you know how you make people laugh and and how you how did that come about anyway well I had done in the early seventies, there were a lot of dinner theaters and in the country. And it was a whole uh, venue available to people that couldn't go to New York or didn't often go to New York to see plays. And they could go and drink and eat and watch a play. And I, uh, in the early 70s, did these plays nonstop. I, I, they were all sitcoms. They were all, you know, two-hour comedies. So uh, I, I groomed my comedy chops on doing dinner theater. And I'm so grateful for it. I, did, I worked with Ed Burns from 77 Sunset Strip. Um, I worked with Donald O'Connor in Wally's Cafe. I worked um, with Pat Paulson in Last of the Red Hot Lovers, who was from Lappin. And uh, I was getting a lot of rave reviews. And Pat Paulson was signed with ICM at the time. And his agent came on the road to one of the towns we were playing. And he saw me and he said, you've got to come to L.A. I'll put you right to work. And I guest starred on Happy Days the first week I got here because of him. And also because of a producer named Bill Bickley, writer producer of Happy Days named Bill Bickley, um, who I'd gone to high school with. So it all kind of went together. So I met Henry Winkler two days after I arrived in LA, Gary Marshall, all the Marshalls. And um, I was just, it was just, a stroke of luck by doing theater. Theater's always been my ticket to the other side of, of the camera, to the camera. Wow. Because in theater, you can sing, you can dress up, you act, and all those aspects of the art in theater. Wouldn't you agree? Well, yeah. I mean, again, in theater, you still have to get cast, you know, that's the great thing about music and doing a one woman show is you can go rehearse and cast yourself and go put your show up and either people come to it or they don't. 
in theater, you still have to audition and get the job. But um, theater, would, I guess, would be my number one love of all of it because it's live and and you know, it's 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 a one it's wonderful. I mean, it, you feel the energy and the love from the audience, and um, and that's why I like performing live. But you know, love to act on film too. So, and you you did something with hair. Didn't you not? Well, I was cast in hair when I was a teenager, actually. And uh, for some personal reasons, I wasn't able to uh, do the show. And they kept calling me to play the role of Jeannie in hair. But I got introduced to rock and roll. And, you know, I started doing rock and roll music before I met my husband, Delaney. Um, and uh, so I was already involved in musicals and musical theater and stuff like that, you know, uh, early 20s. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Now I know we talked about this earlier, but we had to start this over and you talked about how you met your husband or he met you. Yeah. Uh, well, he had seen the Hills have eyes in 1977 at a drive-in with his then girlfriend. And the following night, he was playing at the Starwood in Hollywood. And um, my girlfriend's husband, Daryl Leonard, who's a very well-established trumpet player, was in his band. And she said, let's go hear Delaney Bramlett. And I said, no, nah, I've got to learn lines. And she said, come on. And so she convinced me to go to the club. And and she, we had, she went up to the edge of the stage, say, Daryl, we're here. And Delaney saw me, the light hit me. And he just came right down off the stage and he said, give me your phone number. I'm going to marry you. And I go, I saw you in that movie last night, The Hills of Eyes. And I go, what? Are you nuts? I have a boyfriend. He said, I don't care. I, and so anyway, I gave him my number. We got together the next few days and the rest was history. I mean, uh, we just fell in love and, you know, it, it was, we had 31 years on and off. There were some breakups and going back together. You know, it's very kind of standard Hollywood, you know, Richard Burton, Elizabeth Taylor kind of thing, you know? Right. You love hard, <laughs> you hate hard, and you, you know, you live hard. So, you know, so it was, but it was great. And he, he was such a genius and uh, so instrumental in, in just watching him write a song. So that's kind of how I started. I'd throw in a phrase or a lyric and he would use it. And I go, oh, that was cool. He liked my lyric, you know, and then and then it evolved into me writing my own songs and my own music and the whole song and also write co-writing with some very um, well known musicians on my own, like with Phil Everly and stuff like that. So of the Everly Brothers and I did work with them and uh, well, Phil and um, uh, you know, the Chambers yeah. Brothers. I, I wrote music with George Chambers. So, you know, some great musicians. Wow. And I feel like the, the, they were all keys to help you along your path and your journey and your purpose. Well, yeah, you learn from people who are greater than you are. You know, uh -huh. you learn from people that are experts in their field and their, and, and they, probably wouldn't have made it as as great as they did um if they if they weren't extremely gifted because it's a very competitive uh, all of the art forms are extremely competitive competitive and you know um the best rises to the top and so to be around those people and to learn from them is amazing I'd you say you can learn that in a college, you know, you can learn basic stuff in school, but if you don't get with the people who are actually the masters at what they do, then, um, you know, that's a real blessing to be able to do that. I agree with you, Susan. And I don't, I know you have to get on to an audition soon. I do. So, um, I have some information. If you can email me of, you know, your, the shows that you're going to be doing, I'll be more than happy to post them. Okay. 
uh, on on the description notes and whatnot. And I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank and you I'm, for having me. It's been fun talking to you today. It was a pleasure and honor. And I'm truly grateful for this experience that I get to have with you on my show. It was, except for we had a little F up, but we managed to still work it. And I would love to stay in touch with you and come and see you and see your comedy show. I really want to see that. I hope you will. I hope you will make it up to New York. And uh, also, uh, I have a book coming out. So when I do that, maybe we'll do it again. I would love to have you back on the show so we could talk about that book. Okay, cool. All right. You take right. care. Thank you. Thank you. It, it was my pleasure. Well, there you go. Yes, we did have a mess up, but we managed to get through it. And that's part of the show business. You know, shit happens. You just got to roll and go with the show. So stay tuned for more with Wake Up With KC.